Okay, everyone, welcome to our first panel. I'd like to introduce our moderator, Ted Essex, who is a senior counsel at Hogan Levels in Washington, D.C., where he joined a couple of years ago after spending a decade as a judge on the International Trade Commission. Thank you very much, Josh. And um, it's good to see everyone this morning. Uh, Josh has introduced me fine, and I'd like my panelists to introduce themselves. I think this is a panel that's very different because we have more economists, I believe, than we do have lawyers here. So, Anne, if you would introduce yourself, I'll go down the list as you're in the program. Okay, so my name is Anne Lane Farrar. I'm a vice president at Charles River Associates in Chicago. I'm also an adjunct professor at Northwestern University Law School. Um, PhD economist. There's nothing wrong with having more economists on the panel, by the way. I think that's a good thing. <laughs> Absolutely. Stephen? Hi there. I'm Steve Haber. I'm a professor at Stanford University. Uh, and I think that uh, I like to say about myself that I'm just a guy that gathers data for a living. <laughs> well, we'll see about data today. And Daniel, if you would introduce yourself, please. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I'm Dan Spalber. I'm a professor at Northwestern University. I also work with Cornerstone Research, and uh, all my comments are my own, of course. Of course. And the, the name of our, our panel today is Using Data to Inform Policy, uh, the Empirical Evidence on Standard Central Patents, uh, Standard State Organizations, and Fran Royalties. So that's uh, an awful lot to chew on. Um, Steve, you mentioned that you just are a data gatherer. I think there's probably a lot more to it than that. Would you like to explain how that uh, ties into standard central patents and standard setting organizations and so on today? Thanks, uh, Ted. Uh, let me take a few minutes to uh, talk a bit about why data gathering and data matters um, for studying uh, standard essential patents. Um, one of the big issues that is looming will be uh, the setting of royalty rates for uh, technologies that make use of 5G that is well beyond smartphones, uh, particularly in the automotive sector as we move to the Internet of Things and autonomous cars, but even well beyond uh, the automotive sector. And so one of the, uh, I would one of the big policy debates that is looming is how the government ought to thinking, think about a, a theoretical problem that got introduced into the uh, literature in the early 2000s and then became part of sort of official DOJ and FTC thinking uh, in a number of publications, which was the problem of royalty stacking. And so one of the issues that has emerged is, well, will there be a problem of royalty stacking in the internet of things? So royalty stacking, let me be very clear here, any exercise in gathering data is guided by a theory. Um, people who, get, who build data sets for a living don't just build data sets willy nilly of anything that comes to their mind. They're guided by a theory, and the, the theory of royalty stacking is quite clear. Um, it's based on the notion of Cournot complements, um, and the idea is that a mono one monopoly bad, two monopolies worse, three monopolies even worse than that. The fundamental concept is that each monopolist sets in royalty stacking is setting their price without taking into consideration the prices charged by the other monopolists. And so I'll show you what this should look like. I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, so I hope everybody can see this. <laughs> here we go, uh, share. So I hope you can see that um, and what should be happening is, is the number of patent holders increases, each will earn a lower royalty, but the aggregate royalty should increase so that by the time you hit 10 
patent holders in a market, what should happen is that roughly speaking, 90% of the value of output um, is being consumed by the royalties and output, depending on the shape of the demand curve, the slope of the demand curve will fall by 90%. I want to be very clear here that this is a theory not about effects at the margin. It's a theory that says the industry will collapse. I also want to be clear here that the theory guides us to consider only the royalties that are being leveled by non-implementers. So let's say in the smartphone space, if um, Samsung and Apple give each other cross licenses, those should not be included in the calculation of the royalty stack. It's the, only the actual amounts that should be, um, that are charged by uh, technology companies that are included. So if you parameterize a model, a royalty stacking model using actual data from the smartphone industry, as my colleagues, Alex Galetovich and Lou Zaretsky and I have done, what you'd find is that there are about 30 firms that are, that are in the smartphone space. And the theory predicts that the price of a smartphone should be about five times higher than it actually is that the monopoly royalty, according to a royalty stacking model, would be 79%. And that at sales, instead of being at about one and a half billion phones a year, would be about 69 million phones a year. Now, obviously, we don't observe that. And the reason why we don't observe that is because, let me jump ahead here, the reason why we don't observe that is because the actual royalty stack works out to be about three and a half percent. That's this red line here. So it, what, it suggest, what the data suggests is, is that royalty stacking uh, as a theory is not applicable in um, the smartphone space. And it's not applicable for a number of reasons that both Dan Spulber and Ann Lane Farrar have pointed out. But I'd say the key is this, it's that the the model of royalty stacking or the theory of royalty stacking is built on the notion of one-time play in which, um, and, and in which the people leveling or the firms leveling the, um, uh, the royalties do so independently of one another um, and are not in a repeated game with the implementers. That in fact is not how uh, in the modern uh, sort of world of SSOs, how things work. So I'm going to stop there, but I, I want to simply make clear here that one of the important roles of economics in setting policy is to check theories that have become popular, um, uh, in, in particularly in the federal government, uh, check theories that have become popular against actual data. Now, all data tends to be noisy. But when you're off by a factor uh, of somewhere between 20 and 40 times, it suggests there's something wrong with the theory and it shouldn't be a guide to policy. And it also should uh, inform judges as they make, uh, as they adjudicate cases as to whether or not uh, a theoretical problem is a problem in practice. Well, let me cede the floor here to my colleagues. All right. Thank you, and I, I just wonder when we get enough data like this that uh, if economists will ever just say that they were wrong. Um, we've you know had that a lot of happen. cases involving this, and uh, I've not seen oil stacking. Ann, can you take it from there? Yes, although I'm going to pick up on um, something else that um, Steve ended with, and that is how courts are treating this. So. Um, I think it's useful at this juncture when we're at the very beginning of 5G and IoT to look back and say, what have we learned from the courts? Uh, what kinds of data and theories have they been accepting? And in that past couple of decades of smartphone wars, what lessons can we take forward for the world of 5G and IoT? So at the beginning of FRAND litigation, um, way back in the Microsoft v. Motorola case, the focus was squarely on the issues that Steve was talking about, 
It was all about worrying that implementers um, were being uh, any competitively harmed by high royalty prices that SEP holders were practicing hold up and or royalty stacking. And so it was really about protecting um, the implementers from allegedly supra frand above frand rates. As the case has evolved over time, though, we've seen a lot more balance emerge from the courts and a lot more demanding of data um, to support any kind of theory or argument of what is and is not any competitive or a breach of contract. So, for example, we now have, um, I would say, pretty broad um, uh, consensus that hold out that, that licensees refusing to engage in good faith negotiations um, and still use the technology, still practice the standards, still put products into the market without taking patent licenses is a real problem. And the courts have begun to, to push for um, holding licensees, put putative licensees to, to bear for that. So for example, we've got the Huawei VZTE ruling in Europe which laid out uh, a framework for how uh, both sides of, of the parties needed to behave in order to be considered willing and good faith uh, negotiators. Um, that was picked up again in Unwired Planet. And, and more recently in the IoT world, just a couple of weeks ago, the Mannheim court um, in Nokia v. Daimler found that Daimler was an unwilling licensee. Uh, the court uh, found that Daimler was tr uh, refusing to take a license on its own and trying to push all licensing to so-called tier one suppliers. Those are the makers of the connectivity component that goes into a car. And that uh, Daimler was um, refusing to take any rate that wasn't its own um, counter offer. So anything above what it had counter offered in, in the negotiations was out of bounds and, and Daimler was saying it wouldn't take it. And the court uh, argued or, or determined that not only was that an unwilling licensee kind of stance, but that the counter offer that Daimler was proposing was too low because it didn't fully reflect the value of using the patented technology. Um, in other words, the court was arguing that that value has to be taken um, into account as a whole, all users. Uh, and can't be diced into components. So this is, this is a welcome um, development, I think, in the courts uh, because it recognizes that uh, strategic or opportunities, opportunistic behaviors can happen on either side of the bargaining table and that gates then, uh, the courts are acting as gatekeepers and, and need to balance both sides. Um, in a similar development, I think we've also seen some movement on small assailable patent practicing unit uh, which, which is a theory for FRAND determination that says you have to shove the, the royalty base down to the smallest level to some small component, often a chip or some, some piece that goes into an end product in order to, to calculate reasonable royalties. And all of that is in answer to patent holdup and royalty stacking saying that that's the only way to protect against those evils um, on the SEP holder side. And what we've seen from the courts in recent years is some serious pushback on those theories uh, and demanding of, of real data um, on them. Most recently, we've seen uh, the Northern District of Texas granting Avancis, uh, it's a patent pool uh, over connectivity patents used in cars. Uh, the Northern District of Texas granted Avancis motion to dismiss uh, Con uh, Continental had brought antitrust charges against Avanci and arguing that it was foreclosed from the market because uh, Avanci, the patent pool, was focused on licensing OEMs and wasn't uh, offering licenses to component makers, tier one suppliers, as Continental is. And the judge ruled there that there was no any competitive foreclosure because licensing at a different level in the in the production chain, that is at the OEM level, provided access to everybody in the chain. And so that there was no any competitive foreclosure. And sounding some similar notes to uh, what we saw in the Mannheim ruling uh, in a related case, the, the Nokia v, v uh, Daimler matter, uh, the court in the Northern District of Texas was emphasizing that the royalty rate in order to be friend had to reflect the full value of using the patented technology 
in the end products. So that even if a license were taken at a component level, for example, at a tier one, the price needed to reflect everybody's benefits. Um, and so when you think about this kind of technology in cars, uh, yes, the users are getting all these great apps that they can use in their cards. They have the big screens that they can pull up, um, Google Maps, for example. But the OEMs themselves were also benefiting from the technology in that they're able to monitor all of the software in the car real time. They're getting data on the use of the car and also diagnostics uh, remotely. So that all of those benefits for all the parties had to be reflected in the royalty rate. Um, so this is these Mannheim and the Northern District are some of the first rulings we've seen in, in the IoT space. And so I think it begs the question, what can we learn from the couple decades worth of smartphone wars? What's, what's going to be ported over? What, what is similar and what's really different? And when it comes to determination of friend, I think there's some uh, important similarities, but also some really important differences. So we have broad consensus across the courts in the US and, and other jurisdictions that the use of comparable licenses is a good basis for determining FRAND. Um, that's market data. And that's something that should be true as well for the IoT world, not much of a difference there. Um, and that means not demanding perfect matches, um, but for example, like in TCL ver versus Ericsson, the court recognized that you could take license agreements that didn't exactly reflect the hypothetical negotiation at issue and make adjustments and those are still informative. So that broadens the, the uh, amount of market data that can be applied in these cases and that's a good thing. But there's some serious differences as well and, and that's in the use of top-down method, which is something I think we've seen in a number of telecom cases, notably the TCLV Ericsson case where the court said, okay, Ericsson had announced not only its maximum rate for LG, uh, LTE and, uh, and 5G, or 3G, sorry, um, but it had also announced what it thought uh, a reasonable aggregate rate for those standards um, would be in the use of telecom products. And so it had a reasonable starting point. Both sides then presented a top-down method starting from that aggregate rate and parsing it down to the parties. In 5G and IoT, however, that's gonna be a far more complicated process. First, we don't have nearly as many um, public announcements of rates, either individual rates or aggregate rates. To the best of my knowledge, only Ericsson and Qualcomm have announced individual rates for 5G so, so far, no aggregate rates. And I think that those 5G rates are just in telecom products and not for IoT. All right, and let me so, let me stop you here yeah. for a moment because we need to Go get ahead. everybody in this, including sorry. Dan. Um, that's all right. I appreciate your your information, but Daniel, you've been sitting quietly listening to your colleagues. Uh, what would you say to what they've said so far? Do you want to go in a different direction? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, so uh, hopefully, I can uh, share my screen with everybody and uh, get started. So so uh, let me do that. So here we go. See if this works. Uh, share. Okay, you should all be seeing this screen. So this is the panel on using data to inform policy. And uh, so I'm going to focus in a more general sense on the topic of empirical evidence on SCPs, SSOs, and Fran royalties, if I may. Um, can you all see my screen on the panel and everybody? Yes. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, just as a general proposition, I think we can all agree that data is very important for informing public policy in general and in this topic in particular. Uh, this is the case for many reasons. Within the field of economics, there has been a substantial research shift toward empirical analysis uh, due to advances in econometrics and a shift away from, from uh, exclusive reliance on theory, much more emphasis on econometrics. At the same time, we have all kinds of new techniques going beyond traditional econometrics for gathering and analyzing big data. Uh, in companies, we see an increasing use of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and so on. And the use gathering and use of big data by companies really throughout the economy. Uh, it's important for public policymakers to recognize these enhanced research capabilities that exist throughout the economy 
uh, it, not just in academia, but uh, throughout the uh, uh, throughout the industry. Uh, so this is important for public policymakers because it's in, it's useful for uh, policymakers to analyze what is the current state of the market, how does firm conduct affect competition and performance in the marketplace, how can we compare what effects different public policies will have, and even in fact use data to evaluate public policy outcomes. Uh, this avoids policy prescriptions that are going to be based on guesswork or, or, or fables. Uh, in other words, fears that are just made up or, or based on uh, some conjectures. And it will create evidence-based analysis that will ultimately, one hopes, be more helpful to courts and public agencies as they seek to learn more about uh, the market. So with this set as the background, I want to very, very quickly go through the three things that we were asked to talk about in this session. Uh, how does empirical evidence inform antitrust policy and also the courts in these three topics, standard essential patents, standard setting organizations, or standard development organizations, if you'd like, and also <laughs> fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory commitments. Uh, let's start with uh, standard essential patents. Evidence shows that practically all, practically all licenses, including SCP licenses, are subject to negotiation. Uh, there is a small exception, which is about 10% uh, for SCPs, which is patent pools. But practically all patent pools offer participants uh, and uh, licensees the option of uh, negotiation. So the rates set by patent pools are still subject to implicit limits from negotiation. So practically all SEP licenses, most patent licenses in general, are subject to negotiation. So uh, any assertion that something going on in these markets that's unrelated to negotiation uh, is inconsistent with the description of the market institutions. Uh, negotiation, uh, has all kinds of effects on the outcome of licensing, whether it's patents generally or SEPs. And in particular, it eliminates these predicted outcomes, which are based on alternative views of market institutions. Uh, this may explain why there's practically no empirical evidence for the Cournot effect predictions, such as royalty stacking, SCP holdup, patent thickets, blocking patents, the tragedy of the anti-commons, and all these nearly synonymous fears that have been raised and have been quite influential. Uh, let's turn now to standard setting organizations because uh, short on time, I'm gonna rattle on. So uh, there's significant empirical evidence, much of which was gathered by me in a project uh, uh, here at Northwestern that demonstrates substantial participation in standard setting organizations by adopters of technology, that uh, the SSOs, SDOs have been effective at creating new standards and revising standards. We see tremendous revision or issuing of new standards the diffusion of standards into the economy has been significant. There's been, just in telecom, there's been widespread adoption of 4G, and we're seeing the growth of 5G now, which indicates this diffusion. And the SSOs have been consistent with a growth of invention and the creation and diffusion of innovative products. Uh, this means that the empirical evidence suggests that SSOs develop standards uh, that are widely adopted. And in fact, we can look inside the SSOs and gather empirical evidence about the SSOs themselves. And this shows that most of them develop technology standards through consensus decision making. This process is time consuming, but that doesn't indicate arbitrary delays as some have argued. And the standards are pro-competitive. This is an important point because uh, there have been uh, numerous assertions that technology standards in themselves are indications of an absence of competition. I would argue not only do standards not indicate an absence of competition, they actually are pro-competitive. They encourage participation in the marketplace. Let me run on to the, my final 
point, and that is fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory or FRAN commitments. Again, as I said earlier, most SCP licenses are negotiated. Litigation, in fact, quite rare in this space. Uh, contract law is sufficient for handling the disputes. Uh, many have asserted FRAN commitments have not been spelled out, but actually through the activities of standard setting organizations, through private license negotiations and through the occasional litigation, FRAN commitments are very clear and have been quite effective and therefore regulation and antitrust intervention would not only not be useful, but in fact would impede standardization, would impede the whole process of in invention, innovation and standardization as Macon Del Rehim has emphasized on various occasions. Finally, evidence-based approaches show that FRAN commitments typically do not generate market power. They're consistent with invention and innovation and encourage, in fact, the adoption of standards, which was their entire purpose to begin with. So I've written about this in various places. Here's uh, something from Colorado Technology Law Journal and one in the University of Illinois Law Review that may be of interest. And uh, I can't resist telling you that I have a book coming up, The Case for Patents, uh, but you have to wait a few months. Uh, but in conclusion, I believe empirical evidence is very important for all kinds of IP and antitrust policy making. And uh, evidence is particularly important in this space as we move toward 5G. Thank you very much. I'm going to end sharing. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Daniel. And um, let me uh, comment on what I've heard from all of you. And I, you, you've all done a wonderful job in laying things out, but you know, I've dealt with Etsy and I've dealt with a number of other of the standard setting or standard terming organizations. And I've never seen in any of their agreements that they talk about the smallest practical unit. Um, they've never said it was important uh, to um, implementing and make suggestions. Uh, we've never had a definition that I found. I've been in one particular case where one company said, we will never ever take a license and thus the Supreme Court turns us away and only then, and then we want a FRAN license. Well, if the unwilling non-licensee or potential licensee is, is entitled to a FRAN license, then it seems to me that this really isn't a contract because since everyone gets one, your behavior doesn't matter anymore. Uh, and that has been my experience in dealing with these people in the, uh, in, uh, the ITC, which is just one court. So I want to just ask in that um, uh, you said the basis can be contract law. Under contract law, where they don't define their terms and where they don't have uh, a way of resolving those differences, normally a contract would be found void and the courts wouldn't talk to them. Uh, now, I will admit, as I think any reasonable person would, that these standard setting organizations do a great job uh, in the sense that we get phones, the uh, prices have gone down and so forth. Um, I don't think that we've had an antitrust problem, although I listened to an attorney who was with the FCC and she said that um, even though prices are going down, we're seeing an easy entry in the market, et cetera, et cetera, maybe it would be even better. And so we don't know that this isn't a, uh, something to look at antitrust, which, at which point I left the lecture because if no evidence will provide us with evidence, then there's no point in listening to lectures. So, Let's go around. Those are my thoughts right now, but I'm just a lawyer. I'm not an economist. So, Stephen, what do you think of those things? And how would you... The last point you made, uh, or the last issue you touched on, which is the claim uh, made by uh, a number of attorneys and some economists that, oh, yeah, well, we don't observe royalty stacking. We see fall rapidly falling prices for um, products produced. Uh, within an SSO framework, uh, like a smartphone, but it could be better. Let us just be very clear here. The theory of royalty stacking is not a theory about small effects at the margin. 
It is a theory that predicts markets should fail. And the more licensors you have in a market, each one putatively having a monopoly position over its product, which has been deemed by the SSO essential, or the, or the SSO has agreed to the claim that it is, that's, that, that, that patent is an essential. Uh, uh, well, let me stop you there, Steve, because that's that, kind of a misnomer. Well, so let, that, me, let me interrupt just a moment. I, the point I simply want to make is uh, that, that you cannot, this is not a theory about effects at the margin. It's a theory that says the market should fail. We don't observe that at all. So the claim that it could be better is not is without meaning within the context of that theory. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I just want to add that nobody takes these patents and determines that they are in fact essential. This is a, a matter of fact, the, the claim in almost every organization I've seen is that we have patented technology or patent or intellectual property that might read upon the standard. So there is no, look, we have a standard central patent until a judge or jury comes back. That is the great unicorn. It, no one's seen it. It doesn't exist. So thank you very much on that. And uh, you may even know the, the attorney I was referencing that said, uh, even though there's no evidence whatsoever of the stacking and so on, maybe it would be better. So we can't say it doesn't exist. So in other words, I can't be wrong. How does that hit you? Well, I, I think it's a dangerous path for policymakers because when we um, separate policy decisions from data and, and from evidence, then it's a license to do whatever the hell you wanna do <laughs> with no grounding and it could take us to a very dangerous place. So, you know, I think when people say it could be better, I, I, that's no basis upon which to make policy. Um, just one minor uh, clarification though, there is one SDO that mentions SSPPU, that's IEEE, it made the change in 2015, it was highly controversial. Mm -hmm. um, there've been a number of negative LOAs, letters of, ass of assurance as a result of it. Some people are fine with it, some people aren't, um, but, that's that's a uh, something still working out, I think, in the marketplace as to the experiments that different SDOs take to see what works and what doesn't in terms of attracting membership, maintaining participation, um, attracting uh, innovation contributions, so that new standards do go forward. And, and there right. might be and some evidence that uh, IEEE is going to fall behind on that. They might, they might. And Daniel, I'll let you round this out, and then I'll take you all in another direction. All right. Well, just a, a quick uh, couple of points. The, um, um, the, the, these things are very influential. The, uh, the antitrust guidelines toward intellectual property licensing from uh, the, the DOJ tells us that, that there should not be a presumption of monopoly if someone has a patent license. And I agree with that. Of course, that doesn't mean that people follow the guidelines, their guidelines, and people do whatever they want. And depending on what uh, you know, policy prescriptions are being followed by the DOJ or FTC, they may be favorable to IP or not favorable. But I, I like the great guideline that says patents do not include a presumption of monopoly. I think that's wonderful uh, if followed. Now, my worry is that then there's now a second line of attack on patents, which is that standard essential patents create a presumption of monopoly. And my point is, no, uh, we should have guidelines for that too, that says that having uh, patents that read on a standard should not create a presumption of monopoly. But even then, if we put such a guideline into place, people do all kinds of things that antitrust policymakers can bring suits and do whatever they want, engage in various types of industry mm -hmm. scrutiny. I want to say a quick word about why I mentioned contracts. So uh, I hesitate. Uh, I'm an economist, not uh, I'm just an economist, not a lawyer. Yeah, just not just, not just. There. <laughs> but if I may uh, be so foolhardy as to venture into the law for half a second, uh, that's what I'd like to do. So. Uh, my point is that, uh, as we both know, 
the Fran commitments uh, have been construed by some as a third party contractual obligation. In other words, I make some various commitments to the SSO, but then that creates an obligation to offer the Fran royalty to a third party. So that's one point about there are some implicit contract aspects here and, and they, they're explicit only in, in the sense that they've been interpreted as third party commitments. My other point about contracts is uh, a longer discussion for another time, but I just wanna briefly touch on it. And that is that I have a fundamental objection to the hypothetical negotiation aspect uh, in, in uh, you know, royalty damage discussions. And I would suggest that that tries to create a contract based on imaginary expectations of the parties. And so that's certainly a contract that's never been written. I, I tend to, that's sort of for another day, but I tend to favor. Yeah, good luck getting rid of that one. Yeah, yeah. the more, well, I, I think that we, we can change that. And uh, I believe that the, the finder of fact can help construct the contract based on actual events rather than imaginary expectations. But that would put the burden on Judge Essex if he doesn't mind. Oh, I've had the burden before. Um, as long as I have you here, I have one other question I want to see if this uh, matters to you as economists and that, but um, and I'm mostly familiar with Etsy and their rules. And in Etsy, generally speaking, an implementer is supposed to go to the person who's declared that their intellectual property might read upon the standard and start that negotiation. In my experience, I have never heard of an implementer that tries to license first and then develop something later. So as there's a product in the market, uh, the intellectual property owner finds or believes that it is infringing on their rights and so they have to sue. Yeah. So with all these organizations and the ones that I have read, the, the, there's a burden on the implementers they're supposed to go and license that intellectual property. And does it matter that that never happens? Or is it your experience that that never happens? Or is it just me? Stephen, why don't you go ahead? Nan, we'll let you go second. Stephen? I, th I think that you know what you're seeing are cases uh, in in your role as a judge where inevitably people are suing, but that creates a selection bias because there may be lots of contracts that are reached uh, through uh, negotiation between implementers and technology developers, which never come before you, uh, and in fact are not visible um, to you uh, as a judge because they don't wind up in litigation. And so, you're going to restore my faith in people. Yes. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll give Ann the floor now. All right, Ann, I'm getting less cynical. Are you going to push me the other direction? No, no actually. So it, it is more often the case that the patent holder is the first contactor um, contacting implementers. I don't see a problem with that as long as both parties um, behave in good faith. Because in the standard development context, you may know who has declared patents to be potentially essential to the standard, but you may not know who all plans to implement the products mm -hmm. until you see them. And in the real world of trying to get products to market, if you waited to have a license to everybody before you got that product out, you'd miss the boat. So I'm okay with mm -hmm. some of these ex post negotiations, as long as everybody's behaving in good faith, then the system can work and you can pay back royalties for the period where you infringe before you had the contract, but that means products get to consumers faster um, without wow. unnecessary delays. All right, Daniel, they're restoring my faith in humanity and manufacturers. So are you gonna keep me going that direction or push me back to the cynical side? Well, I guess I'm cynical too, but uh, oh, you know, goodness. the system works. Uh, the, the patent pools, uh, uh, announce rates and people take those licenses, uh, admittedly small. My, my feeling is litigation rates are tiny. They're in the 1% or so range. And so uh, I, I, something's going on in terms of negotiation. Now, it may be that the person with the financial interest moves first. I, I'm with you there. But on the other hand, the litigation is very rare. So things, they work it out one way or the other. So, uh, neither here nor there on humanity, but 
pretty good on market <laughs> outcomes. <laughs> well, that's a Ted, faith we in do the have a couple questions in the chat room. I just wanted to highlight that. All right. Well, let's. Uh, where, where are those? And, and, and do you want to go ahead and start one, Anne, if you've seen them? Oh, where sure. I can read out the first one from sure. uh, Aman Sinha uh, to all panelists. Do you think that in future, in a world where we have fully automated driving vehicles, uh, will the 5G patent holding entities like Qualcomm, Ericsson, et cetera, will be taking a larger portion of the downstream product, i.e. the automobile, would this not lead to royalty stacking? So that's the first question. Okay, thank you. So uh, let me just take a stab at that. I think the short answer is, it does not necessarily follow that that should lead to royalty stacking. Um, we, uh, this was a problem, you know, uh, 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 a theory that was developed in the, uh, in the IT space. We never saw any evidence of royalty stacking. Now think about this for a minute. If you took, let's say all of the Ericsson and Qualcomm patented, patented technologies out of a smartphone, what would the smartphone be worth? It wouldn't be worth zero. It'd be a paperweight. It'd be a paperweight. Yeah. What percentage of the value of the phone do Qualcomm, Ericsson, Nokia, etc. take? Uh, our calculations are somewhere around, including everything, including the non-CEPs for all 31 entities that are licensing into the space. It's around three and a half percent of the value of a phone. I don't see why the outcome in uh, autom automobiles should be any different than it is in smartphones, um, because one can imagine, in fact, an automobile um, that does not necessarily use um, uh, any particular technologies that in the, in the way that a smartphone, because of the need for connectivity across phones, had. So I don't worry about the problem of royalty stacking here. And I don't worry about it for the same reasons, which is that there is a repeated game between the technology developers and the implementers in which they're working together. It's no secret to anybody that the technology developers are developing technologies to be put into automobiles or trucks produced by implementers and that means that they're going to negotiate prices that are not going to reflect monopoly pricing. I, I'm going to, if Ted will give me one second here on this. Anybody who's ever been to a baseball game and bought a hot dog or been to a movie theater and bought a bucket of popcorn has experienced monopoly pricing. Um, there are ways that economists measure whether or not a monopoly royalty is in fact being levied. We have not observed that in any of the contracting around, for example, smartphones. There is therefore no good reason that we should expect to observe it in the, in the autom automotive space and for the same reasons, because these firms are not in one, um, they're not in single shot play, they're in repeated play. And there is always, because in repeated play, there's, a, there's the opportunity for um, substitution away from one technology to another as standards evolve. All right. Uh, uh, let me, let gonna, me add a little to that, if uh, we could. Let me pause you for just a moment. Okay. Because we're about at 1130. We're close to that. Uh, would those listening get your pens or pencils up? The password that I have been given for our session and these all appeared to me to be in capital letters, but it is A-S-D-T-F-R-A-N-D. That's A-S-D-T-F-R-A-N-D. And that's our password. What do you have to say after the password? <laughs> so I just wanted to pick up where Steve left off and say, uh, when you're setting royalties at the OEM level, it's it's not necessary that you you port the exact same model that was used in smartphones. So there was a lot of percentage of end price uh, royalty setting for smartphones for the reasons that Steve's already discussed. In IoT, what we're seeing, at least in automotive, 
is people are looking at valuing uh, the use of the technology. So they're not taking the car's price. That yes, you're licensing at the OEM at the car level, but you're not taking the car's price as reflective of some value of using the connectivity. Rather, uh, there've been a lot of data presented on what that value is to consumers and to the OEMs, measuring that, using that as the royalty base. So that's yet another reason why I'm not concerned about royalty stacking there is you, you take whatever product or service you're talking about and you, you develop a royalty regime that makes sense for that product or service. And the level of the where the royalty is paid is really kind of divorced from that. If you're capturing the value correctly, you can charge it at any level. It can be passed through by component makers with indemnification, or it can be paid by the end product maker with everybody else um, covered as a result. Okay, Daniel? well, yes, thank you, Ted. Uh, I would like to thank the questioner for asking this question. And it's not a coincidence he's asking or she, because this is indeed the frontier. And uh, I think that we've talked about uh, smartphones, but now we're about to enter the era of the smart car. So it's not surprising that we see the battle shifting. I completely agree with uh, Anne here that it's not the percentage of the price. In fact, we're not talking about 3% of a $30,000 vehicle. In truth, we all agree that we're talking about a few bucks at the end of the line. And yet, it's absolutely amazing, speaking of Ted's faith in humanity, that the automakers will go to the barricades for a few bucks on a car. I can't believe that the market is that sensitive that they need to do that. And in fact, this was shown in an amazing, Anne mentioned this case earlier uh, in, the, uh, in Texas, uh, Continental versus the patent pool Avanci. What's amazing there is uh, that Continental uh, comes forward and is really speaking for somebody else. I don't know who, could it be Daimler Benz? And then the court pierced the veil brilliantly, I thought, and figured out. And in fact, my favorite aspect of this case, if I may briefly mention it, is that the court cites the riverboat gambling precedent that a dock owner can't complain about the riverboats. And in the same way, Avanti is hearing complaints from Continental Parts Maker, who's like the dock owner, when the real riverboat gamblers are somebody and affecting somebody else, we don't know who or do we? I don't know. But anyway, the automakers are all excited about a few bucks on the car and it's a fascinating thing and it's a we learn a lot about uh, this issue of uh, a payment and so on i don't think it'll be much i don't think it's an issue but uh, the battle has begun it certainly has i know that um why don't we take a look at this second uh question because i'm not uh, familiar with what they're talking about the by dole acts march in rights we're allowing the government to withdraw the exclusivity of licensing for patents that were funded by government research dollars with a reasonable standard, reasonable standard as well. I'm curious to hear any comparisons between the Fran regime and those concepts as to an antitrust space. Now I'm going to throw that out to my panelists here because I don't know what he's talking about. So perhaps one of you would like to lead off. Uh, I know like about both Bidol and Stevenson Weidler, which were both passed in the 1980s, and they were meant to um, break a logjam. So the government was funding um, lots of research, but that research wasn't making it to the market. It wasn't getting to consumers because there were no incentives to develop it. Um, you, you need to have some sort of profit incentive to take the next steps after early stage university research to get it into some sort of commercializable product. And so the goal of both Bidol and Stevenson Weidler were to broaden the development and therefore the consumer benefits of research that was originally funded by the government. Now, I'm not sure I understand then the relation to the Frand regime, um, I, unless the questioner is suggesting that some uh, something similar could be done by SDOs, 
I, I, I have to confess, I don't really get the question, even though I understand where Baidol and- All right, Steve's well, we'll make it a toss up for the rest sorry. of the panel. Steve, Daniel, yeah, did either of you uh, wanna- I'll pass on this one. Uh, Baidol okay. did a good thing, but this, I don't understand. Yeah. All right, well, let's go on to the next one then, if we have time to do it. Um, and disruptive technologies oftentimes come from startups and former employees that are underfunded. How do these entities overcome the reduction in perceived value if the patents are not seen as exclusive rights? Um, my quick thought is if the patents aren't exclusive, they can't, but um, uh, perhaps they're getting something else that we can help with. Uh, Stephen, can you help with that question? I think I, this, underneath this question is a very important concept, which is <clears throat> that patents are valuable to smaller firms, not to large firms that dominate markets. If you control the market, you don't, you don't necessarily need a patent. What patent rights do is protect innovative companies by allowing them, because they do get an exclusive right, to, uh, to uh, the, the patent grants them the right to exclude, it gives them an opportunity to appropriate some of the, to appropriate the returns to their efforts and investments. And if you took that away, you would get a lot less innovation in the United States. And in, in fact, this is one of the reasons why uh, Megan Del Rahim at the DOJ, I think has been very wise uh, in reconsidering um, the way that uh, the DOJ has looked at uh, standard essential patents. Um, in a world in of very, very weak patent rights, what you basically have is a few very, very large firms that would be vertically integrated and would dominate markets. And then in fact, you might get monopoly pricing uh, for all kinds of consumer products. Um, I'd All like right. to, oh, did, is okay. Go right, go right ahead, Daniel. I, I'd like to say I agree very much with uh, what Stephen just said. And in fact, since we're on the subject of empirical analysis, uh, empirical research has shown that patents are extremely valuable to entrepreneurs. It, uh, it's the case because entrepreneurs are able to, first of all, protect their new products from uh, attacks from often big companies that want to take the technology. Also, the entrepreneur is able to license their technologies to incumbent firms, and that's often an important source of money. The uh, entrepreneur is also able to sell their products to big firms. This is a uh, an important thing that maybe doesn't get enough attention. So for example, BMW talks about the venture client model where they help new firms by buying their high tech products, which in turn helps BMW. And finally, it's been shown that having a good patent or two is very useful to the entrepreneur to secure financing, uh, whether it's from VCs or, or other sources. And so, uh, the patents are valuable to the entrepreneur in many different ways. And if it's a standard essential patent, so, so be it. But uh, the, the patents are very important to the little guy. And the little guys can become the big guys. Uh, very often, there are big firms that owe their beginnings to the small startup that had the new technology. So yeah. And final word. I agree with everything my colleagues have said. I, well, they seem point. very bright here. Go ahead, Stephen. I'll give that, that there's one of the things that one of the fables that gets told about the patent system is somehow all this technology licensing is new. Actually, it goes all the way back to the mid 18th century in England, um, where uh, the basic model of, an, of many inventors, including Bolton and Watt, uh, came up with the improvement to the steam engine was to license uh, an implementer downstream. And that's why the, the first US patent laws in 1790 and 1793 were mindful of the fact that small uh, guys, uh, individuals even, were going to take out patents, not to produce the product, but to license them 
Um, what, there are two very famous examples of this, uh, one of which produced a license and one of which didn't. Goodyear, uh, what we call the Goodyear tire, uh, was, was a set of uh, patents held by Charles Goodyear. Charles Goodyear never produced a tire. He licensed firms to produce uh, tires using his vulcanization process. The second is Abraham Lincoln, who took out a license, who took out a patent that he had hoped to license for technology to raise boats to get over sandbars on the Ohio River. He had no interest in, of course, being in the boat business. Uh, he was he was wanted to be in the technology licensing business. So the point I simply want to make is this has been happening for a very long time, technology licensing. It's been by small guys, and it has been part of the reason why the U.S. moved from being a backwater colony of Great Britain to having the wealthiest e economy in the world 200 years later. Well, you can take it back even further to the 1700s with Adam Smith and uh, uh, comparative advantage and specialization. So that's this is just another uh, instance of that. My goodness, we have history buffs on the panel here. <laughs> yeah. What are, what about the uh, sewing machine patent tickets? Does anybody want to get back into those? Uh, we need Adam Lassoff for that one, don't we? <laughs> now, we did have one other question. I think it's a relatively easy one to wrap up with. But it talks about, um, uh, and as a follow-up, the only thing that would be that the cost of automobiles would range between 10 to 100 times that of a mobile phone. So the difference between a 3% royalty and 5% royalty is going to be quite a lot. Um, I think that they mean if, if it's done as a percentage of the whole. Yeah, and um, it hasn't been to date. And I don't, I don't know why it would be ever because it'll be such a small percentage of the car. It'd be really hard to calculate. It'd be hard to explain. Mm -hmm. So as I was saying earlier, to, to date, anyway, the way it's been done is measures of the value of using the technology within the car. That then defines the, the royalty base, not the price of the car. And it's not a percentage of that value. It's then a dollar per unit. So Avanci charges a dollar per unit. And the individual licensees that I'm familiar with charge dollars per unit. Uh, it's a flat fee. Um, that's what's happened so far. And, and I think that makes sense, given the application um, that, you're, that you're looking at, right. not I, percentages. Yeah, I, I think that the, the key is this, is that what we observe as an outcome as a market outcome in the smartphone space is a, is a total royalty um, uh, across all implementers of somewhere between three and 5% if you add them all together. That doesn't mean that in the automotive space that the royalty will be between three and 5%. The market will work out what the, um, the value of the patents are to those functionalities um, that are that are that are made possible by the patents, and I, I think the key here is that that the government uh, and courts shouldn't be in the business of determining uh, what that royalty should be. They should let uh, private parties contract and observe what emerges as a market equilibrium, and then in cases where there are disputes that wind up in court, then the appropriate guide are those other contracts and what we observe in the market rather than uh, either bottom up techniques which rely on uh, contracts that never existed for products that never existed or for technologies that never existed or top down which has no known um, basis in any mainstream economic theory I know of. So right. if I Go can ahead, jump in briefly. So we're in the midst of uh, an important change in the car. The car has been a fundamental part of uh, industrialized economies for, for many years. And we're right now in, in the midst of an important change. Uh, at the very least, the connected car, where the car is connected to the internet and to other cars is a big development. Whether autonomous driving emerges is another question. And uh, so we're at the beginning of this big change. And I think it shouldn't surprise anyone that there's a discussion among companies 
as to what the technology will be, what the various contributions of uh, technology providers will be, uh, what the role will be for the auto companies. I mean, they used to produce every single part that went into a car. Today, they are tending a little bit more toward assembly. And so it's, it's a big moment and I, I think it will prove important and uh, the standards organizations and uh, the IP policy will play an important role. And, if, and I agree with uh, Steve that uh, there's uh, important market forces that, that will help uh, guide us toward the outcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me throw something else. Oh, Josh, are you ready? Unmute. You, you can go to one last thing. All right, I just like for one last thing in this, I was a judge at the International Trade Commission for many years. And the one thing in standard central patents, when they were asserting that, in, in the 10 years I was there, we never had any evidence on Clayton saying whether or not their patent was in fact standard essential. And we never had any evidence uh, from the respondents saying it was standard essential because, um, and therefore they were entitled to either a friend or certainly non exclusion order. What I found is that the respondents, this is my opinion, didn't want to say anything because they wanted to put uh, infringement and validity into play. And the complainants never wanted to put anything in regarding standard central nature of the patent because they wanted an exclusion order and they didn't want to let the judge have the confusion perhaps of saying that since a FRAN license would be good enough, you don't get an exclusion order. So it seems to me that the parties are quite capable of trying to work these things out without even re referring to some of the regime in that when it's in their interest. So very quickly, because I see Josh there. Stephen, does that make sense to you? Uh, I'm going to circle back to a theme that you have introduced into this panel, which is your faith in humanity. And I have faith in human beings in their ability to come up with uh, to adapt to circumstances uh, and to uh, frame arguments in such a way that it uh, favors them in a legal dispute. Um, and uh, it's the job of judges and juries <laughs> then to figure out um, what, um, which parts uh, of the inventive adaptations that uh, lawyers come up with uh, hold water and which don't. Thank you, Daniel. Last word, quickly. Okay, last word is uh, your question reminds me of the thoughts of Ronald Coase, who said that in negotiation, people could work around some of the legal rules to get to where they wanted to go. So there's a bit of that maybe going on. Well, many, many a career has been made by working around the rules and the laws and that uh, I don't know that individual, but I know a lot of people will make a career of that. And final, and then Josh, I'll oh, give it to I'm you. Good. All right, Josh. Okay, thanks, Judge Essex and the rest of the panel for a very interesting discussion. For all the attendees, we have uh, about a 12 minute break now, and then we'll start our keynote with Director Yanku. So feel free to grab a coffee or lunch or breakfast if you're you know, elsewhere, and we'll see you again in a couple of minutes. Thanks to all of you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I appreciate your, your, your participation and appreciate your help.